a, a, a catalyst speeds up, it's a substance that speeds up a process without getting consumed itself. When you see those possibilities and you pursue them and you look to simplify them and you see, you know, and you, and you see what's possible, trying to get others to see what's possible, you've got to make sure in the true chemical catalyst that you don't get consumed. Hi, I'm Tracy Lovejoy. And I'm Shannon Lucas. We are the co-CEOs of Catalyst Constellations, which is dedicated to empowering Catalyst to create bold, powerful change in the world. This is our podcast, Move, Move Fast, Fast, Break Shit, Shit Burn Out, where we speak with Catalyst executives about ways to successfully lead transformation in large organizations. And I'm thrilled today to have with us our good friend, Dominic Bizarro. Welcome, Dominic. Well, thank you for having me here. It's great to see you both. Dominic is a healthcare and health tech executive turned executive catalyst who specializes in empowering healthcare leaders to navigate complexity and drive growth through innovation, most recently in his role as chief strategy officer at MVP. With a particular focus on shepherding women and humanistic leaders into the executive ranks, Dominic is committed to creating high performing human centered, centered leadership environments. We had the good fortune to collaborate with him uh, during his tenure as an executive at MVP Healthcare. We'll hear more about that. But I love how Dominic continually seeks and shares insights on leadership, burnout prevention, super important, and cultural transformation. His mission, which I cannot uh, support more, is crafting fulfilling leadership lives for high impact, purpose driven leaders to positively impact a thousand company cultures. Boom, Dominic. So good to have you here. So that's sort of the high level, but we would love to hear from you in your own words about your catalytic journey. Maybe you can share a few career highlights that you're proud of that helps us to see your catalytic nature. Sure. Well, thanks. Thanks for the intro. And uh, as I said, really great to be here uh, with you today. So I, you know, I'm a healthcare person. So I started life as a pharmacist. So it all started behind a, a pharmacy counter. And then it's kind of a strange, kind of, circuitous journey over three decades. Um, I've really worked lots of different parts of the healthcare industry, you know, from being a provider um, to uh, being uh, president of a large physician practice, as you said, the work at MVP, which is a health insurance and a health services company. But over 12 companies, probably hmm, 25 to 30 different roles, um, and so the path wasn't linear, uh, for sure. And I, I don't even think it was necessarily logical. I knew I wanted to help people and I wanted to be in service, but wasn't always sure of the best way how. So I kept exploring and, and, uh, you know, all the while absorbing what I think is an, an incredible amount of working knowledge, experiential knowledge of a very complex industry that that is healthcare. Um, like many, many people are in complex, highly regulated industries um, that are that are dynamic. So all that learning and that exploration and desire to improve healthcare lend itself to to really seeing possibilities. And um, you know, so I, I think my my whole career has been connecting the dots and like seeing the possibilities in business and and people. And even like the last 10 or 15 years, especially in people, because you can see the possibilities in business, but then really simplifying the complex, communicating it and getting it started, like literally being a, a catalyst for positive change. Um, so when I reflect back on my career and the things that I've done and the people I've worked with, it's all kind of all rooted in that. Was there a moment that you realized that you might be operating differently than other people in those highly regulated healthcare environments? Well, there was a moment where I knew I was operating differently. And I think it was like in um, second or third grade when, you know, how, like you had to show your work when you did math problems. I never did. And um, it wasn't that I didn't believe in the value of the way they were teaching it. I just thought like I didn't have those traditional paths to solving problems, right? So, um, you know, I 
I, I think it came down to, so I started, I started life as a pharmacist and I worked for Walgreens and at 25 years old, I had worked, I don't know, maybe 15, 20 different stores at, at Walgreens because I was an intern there and stuff. And it was in South Florida, it was growing fast. So I had the opportunity to become a district manager. So I, I ran 20 stores. I was 25. I was the youngest person in Walgreens to do this. This is back in, I don't know, 91 or something, 1991. My youngest pharmacist was 32 years old. I was 25, <laughs> right? So like clearly I was in over my head, um, but I got some really good advice from a mentor. And, uh, you know, this person told me, look, this this boils down to three things. You got to find the best pharmacists. You got to help them identify the best workflows, you know, in their organizations. And then, you know, and this was the really complex piece of the advice, be helpful. Right. So I really boiled it down to that. Like I'm 25. I mean, I was kind of a, you know, outgoing person, persuasive person. So I just went and met every single pharmacist in the counties where my stores were. And I got the best pharmacist. And because I worked in a lot of different stores and I could see where their workflow was a little clunky and not so clunky, I'd kind of go in, just sit and observe and then offer some thoughts. Hey, what about that? What about that? You know, and you know, helped in that regard. And then when they needed something, I advocated for them. You know, I advocated to to get what they needed from the corporate office. So I, I think that was the beginning of it, you know, is that, yeah, there's a lot going on. It's complex, but I think every business you can boil down to a few numbers, a few processes and a few themes. And certainly people, you know, is, is at the center. So I've had lots of different experiences where, where that came to be. And then the innovation mind is more like, okay, if you extend that to the business itself and you look at what the competition is doing, if you naturally have like a contra type of thinking where you're, you know, trying to say, okay, well, where's the opportunity? We can't just show up and be like everybody else. You know, how do we, how do we differentiate? Um, that, that, that really it's, it's helpful. I think maybe to see what others don't. Um, yeah. And um, I think it's mostly helpful to say what others won't, mm. but not always. <laughs> so, <laughs> and you have to be careful yeah. about the delivery. Um, okay. Absolutely so, do. Yeah. This yeah. is amazing. So uh, what I heard was what you learned along your way as a catalyst was focus on recruiting and keeping top talent, looking for places to simplify processes and make improvement, be helpful to the, those around you, maybe bring some of the outside in thinking and say what others won't when appropriate in the right way. Is that fair? Yeah, I think, I think that's, that's a lot of it. And, and I would tell you that, you know, as you know, there's, there's a lot in those challenges, but I think that that is to me fundamentally like in chemically as a pharmacist, you know, it, a, a, a catalyst speeds up. It's a substance that speeds up a process um, with, I'm trying to think of my chemistry 101 definition, without the, without getting consumed itself. And so that led a lot to the inner work, right? You know, mm. you're both catalysts, people listening to this, uh, you know, might, might be catalysts or likely are catalysts. When you see those possibilities and you pursue them and you look to simplify them and you see, you know, and you, and you see what's possible, trying to get others to see what's possible, you've got to make sure in the true chemical catalyst that you don't get consumed, right? You don't, you don't. Amen. Yeah. How, how do you, how do you not get consumed, Dominic, as you're, as you're going through the change process? Yeah, I think uh, really going back to basics, um, again, I have to simplify things um, personally, just because, uh, you know, like many, uh, there's a lot going on in my mind and I'm just a voracious learner. You know, I love to learn and I'm wildly curious. So to me, I try to boil it down to any change, transformation, improvement process comes down to four things. One, honor the past. Two, complete the past. Three, manage today because you have a today going on, right? You have a lot of activity going on today. And four, create tomorrow. 
where I have um, had challenges or had successes or seen organizations or teams or people have challenges or successes, it goes back to those basics. Did you honor the past? Did you complete the past? In a fact, what, what does that what yeah, what does that one mean yeah. for you? I'm super curious about that one. Um, so maybe I'll use an example we can all relate to, right? I think I had really good parents. I don't think I had perfect parents. I think my wife and I were really good parents, and I know we weren't perfect parents. So even if you had very good parents, 80% of what they taught you, I think you want to carry forward. 20% at some point needs to get chucked off the train as you're going through your leadership journey, right? So we can honor the past and get what we know makes sense going forward, what may be timeless, but we have to complete it. We don't bring everything with us. If you don't honor the past and you're in an organization and you're trying to catalyze a new change effort, catalyze a new possibility, a new business, a new branch, a new product, whatever it may be, a new initiative, you can't rush past honoring the past because there's some people there who are really, I'm not going to say attached, but that's a lot of their identity. You know, they contributed that value. Honor it. Got to get them to recognize the world is changing quickly. You all talk about a VUCA world quite a bit. I mean, right, it is just rapidly changing. Even the demographic of the world is changing, you know, let alone the technology and the societal impacts of all those things. So we need them and we all need to recognize you've got to complete it. It's not going to serve you or it's not going to serve us going forward. And then managing today is just say, okay, as you're starting something new, you got to recognize there. There's a lot of things that are already in motion. There's an inertia. So how do we both manage the business of today and create the business of tomorrow? I'd love to bridge from this to understand, you know, 25 jobs, 12 companies, a subset of which you were an executive. Mm -hmm. What were some of the biggest challenges that you, you faced as a Catalyst executive? Because I'm wondering if some of these frameworks come out of that tough learning. Oh, yeah. Um, you don't have to wonder. They all do. Uh, <laughs> I, I wish I could have. I wish I would have known all of that. Like right? at 25 years old. This um, is why we do the podcast. Right? Share yeah. it with them. Yep. <laughs> and you know, I, I wish for me, obviously. So it wasn't so like torturous, but more than anything, I, I wish it for the people around me. Right. I wish, I wish I could have imparted, you know, that wisdom, you know, and done it in a way that was, you know, kind of neutral and right. we kind of look at it and we observe it together and that it was kind, right? So I think these lessons I take, it's more for the people around me more than than anybody else. So I I do think it comes down to, as I said, I think that that simple path of um, you know, we you can't realize you know, what, what you see without people helping it be, right? Coming into reality. So it's not enough to see it. No strategy fails in formulation. They all fail when they do fail in execution. So uh, Indra Nui, who I really... I, I love her book, My Life in Full. Um, and I uh, she's on my virtual advisory board, which maybe I'll talk about a little bit later. But she talks about the fundamental role of a leader is to look for ways to shape the future, right? Shape the decades ahead, not just react to what's going on right now in the present. And she says, and to help others accept the discomfort of disruptions to the status quo. So where I have failed, it's been there. And it's not always because like I had the magic that I could do that, but one, I need to keep it in focus and realize there's a team around me, right? And that team could be within your organization. It could be amongst your team, but it's not just you. You have to solve that problem. Say so you have to help others accept the discomfort of disruptions to the status quo. And so, you know, that's how I met you all, right? Like I was at MVP, 
40 year old health insurance company, basically a risk management organization with a world that was changing quite a bit around it um, in a future that was quite uncertain as to what does a not-for-profit regional health plan do, you know, to deal with this world where you have these huge national providers and then, you know, you, you've just got tons of disruption. You don't have access to the capital, but you do have some assets in the organization. It's like, well, we need help because I know we have people in the organization who can help us bring these ideas to scale and can help us bring into bring us into the future while we're managing um, today. But we need some help in doing that because like mainly what I've done, what 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 I've done wrong, I think mostly in my career and what I see a lot of catalysts do is they just break organizational speed limits. And when you break organization, you know, and when you break the organizational speed limits, one thing if the organization speed limit is 30 and you're going 35, it's another if you're barreling at 70 miles an hour, that's going to cause crashes. Even if you think you're getting that from the highest levels of leadership saying, go, 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 go. You got to be a real translator. Okay, hang on now. What is the speed limit? And yeah. that came to light to me when we did partnerships, because now, you know, when you've got two big organizations, they both have different speed limits. You got to be able to modulate, you know, your speed going where, where you are and, yeah. and really try to kind of distill and process as an executive. Yeah, you know, you're getting pushed on these fronts or you need the change or you need the growth or you need the profitability or, you know, you need the new possibilities, but the strategy is really not the issue. You know, the yeah. 10 strategies out there for work, the execution is the challenge. And so breaking organizational speed limits has been something that, you know, guilty. Um, and um, so how do I deal with it? I always go back to basics. You know, did I enter the past, complete the past, manage today, create tomorrow, Am I recognizing, are my mind, is my, are my mindsets right? Um, you know, all catalysts have a growth mindset, but am I owning it? Well, do I have an ownership mindset? So in your terms, it might be own your shit, right? Like understand who you are and understand that you need to grow. If the organization's going to grow, the team's going to grow. Mm -hmm. And when you model that, the people around you see it and they see, you know, when you fail. And you got to be vulnerable, you know, about that, that failability. And then I think, so that awareness mindset to me is really big, the ownership mindset and the awareness mindset, because we're all going to, we're all imperfect. We're all going to mess up. It's such a powerful list. And, and just to uh, things that I noted, tell me if I'm getting this right, kind of in passing, you were talking about sometimes not always being steady and kind as a leader, yeah. right? That that's a challenge for us as catalysts that ties so much to, it's not enough to see it. We have to mm -hmm. remember that it's about bringing other people along. And so we can be so lost in get, get it fucking done. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that we're not necessarily kindly bringing people along and understanding that that's the path to moving it forward. I, I think there's two dimensions of organizational kind. speed yeah. limits. Yeah. Tell me what were you going to say? Two dimensions of kind is one is like, so one is the spinach in your teeth kind of kind, mm -hmm. right? Like, so what I found you know, I, I got kind of um, indoctrinated, you know, into a culture that I would say is kind of more of a masculine trait type culture, like go, 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 high performance, push through obstacles, you know, those, those, those types of things, right? So there's, there's that, that, that can make you unkind, because you're so performance driven, and you hide yeah. behind the veil of being performance driven, right? You know, and you just use it to kind of like cloak. The other part of being kind, which I had early in my career, and I see a lot in uh, the women leaders that I work with, is that caring and empathetic and stopping them, especially for the early leaders, the you know rising leaders who are just getting more teams, but not saying the things that need to be said when they provide mm. feedback, right? So my coach, Mary Pat Knight, um, taught me, you know, because I got to simplify it. So Mary Pat, help me. I got I to gotta simplify this. So when I'm giving feedback, give me something to work with. She goes, be factual, be direct, not a problem for you, neutral, and kind. And then she taught me the two dimensions of kind you know, who was showing up. So factual, direct, neutral, and kind. And that was really important to me. But I, I love that. 
yeah, organizational speed limits you, you brought up. Yeah, well. I mean, it, you're you're giving us layers of, I'll kind of stay with the kind and then I'll come back to organizational speed limits, the like the awareness of which this is a part of it, owning, owning the me and seeing how I'm acting within the system, mm-hmm. connecting that to the problem that you see and being able to slow down to bring other people with that and how you're doing it. Mm-hmm. And then seeing the system in which, this opportunity already sits. So going back to, you know, that beautiful framework of honor the past, complete the past, manage today, create tomorrow, the, there is history, there is culture. uh, There is a lot to acknowledge that sits here. There are organizational speed limits, right? So I just, I feel like you've given us a three-dimensional way to think about the challenges that we run into with some really fun ways of talking about it. I, I've never heard organizational speed limits and I'm stealing that. Just saying. Totally. Steal it. Yeah. And I'd love to, you started to make this connection at the beginning mm-hmm. uh, of sharing all of that, which is like, and that's why how we came together around the Catalyst program. So I'm wondering if you can help connect the dots for the audience, like as you were thinking about those frameworks slash problem sets slash opportunities, what sparked you about the Catalyst program and then what unfolded that sort of supported the way that you were, you know, envisioning helping MVP adjust their organizational speed limit? I'm trying to remember how I got connected to you all. I think it might Susan have been Lindner. Susan Lindner. Susan yeah. Lindner, yep. Yeah. So then, you know, I bought the book and um read the book and was like running back and forth from the couch talking to my wife. And I'm like, listen to this. You know, and I'd read her this and I was like, who do you know that's like that? You know, and then I'd go back to the couch, read the book, listen to this. You know, and you know, so so I just reached out to you, you know, and connected. And and why did I reach out? Because, you know, I felt like it um if I sit down across from someone and do what my grandmother always taught me, I can connect with them. But I felt like I was losing the ability and the opportunities and the reach to connect with everyone, you know, to get them to see the possibilities and and how they can contribute to it in ways maybe they didn't even think were possible. And I also knew I didn't, I, I wouldn't be the right person to connect with everyone that needed to be connect with. Also knew that it wouldn't scale, even if I was, you know, this magical person who could speak to anybody at all levels of leadership in the organization and the board and staff and, you know, so forth and partners. And when I read the book, I was like, all right. Uh, Then I started doing a little research. I reached out to you all and you told me what you did. I was like, that's what we need. We need a movement. One, we need identification, right? I know that we had, I think at the time we had like 1,500 people in the organization. I know we had, you know, 50, 150, I don't know what the number is. I know there was a lot of people who had these traits. And if they did, and I was convinced they did have these traits, I know there was a lot of people who were feeling stuck. And, you know, they didn't want to be stuck. They wanted to be unstoppable, right? Because that's what catalysts want to do. But, you know, Along the way of trying to be uh, being unstoppable, you're going to get stuck sometimes. So I just said we need to help, and um, so that's when you know introduced you to uh, the leadership team uh, at MVP, and then at some level tried to after the introduction tried to stay kind of hands off because you know I was seen a certain way of well he's an executive in the company and blah blah blah, which is so weird when you're a catalyst. You don't I don't know that you ever like. I, I never really saw myself as an executive. You know, people say that. It's just like, yeah, you know, you're you on me. Um, but that, when when I saw and learned and heard some of the stories of the companies you work with, and then you invited me to attend some of your uh, community, some of your trust, um, and listen to others, I was like, yeah, these these are people that, that uh, the leadership at MVP needs me. So I introduced you to Chris and the team at MVP. And... Uh, you know, brought you in and, you know, made a big, made a big difference because we're, the, the company was going through a lot of change, still is. Um, and um, yeah, I felt like they just, they found their people, but more importantly, they found a way to say, okay, how do you make this work? How do you go from, you know, 
what you see to what comes to be because really seeing is not enough i think for most catalysts you know they want to see it come to be right so obviously we had such and still have such a great time seeing the impact and i think it's so like as i apply some of your framing um around the sort of pivot MVP has such a beautiful culture. I mean, it's like when we, when as we've been working with MVP, there's almost like the sense of family, um, like it's a deep, deep commitment. And it's been so fun for us to see that sort of the shift, really, like you know, the, the, some of the organizational speed shift, but also the like the moving from the completing the past to to creating the tomorrow. And I'm just wondering how you've seen that play out in terms of like impact with the catalysts that we put through the first round. Yeah, I think there was a marrying of like the reality of, you know, where is the organization at? Where is the industry at? Um, but almost a simplification is like, look, on the other side of what we do, there's a customer. And these customers are fundamentally, yeah, MVP is an insurance company, right? But fundamentally, they're trying to figure out how do I gain access to care to deal with this new mm. situation I have in front of me, this new healthcare situation. And how do I prevent my health from declining? Those are the two like fundamental jobs. And, you know, the affordability of getting access to care is important. So I think people connected really at that strong higher purpose. So it kind of fed into the culture and said, okay, on the path to that, to having and building on the trust that we have, you know, with our customers and we want to build because, you know, nobody wakes up in you know, every morning it says, I love my insurance company, right? You know, insurance company and love, not a lot of uh, kind of connection between those two. But you you all went in and you saw like the spirit, you know, of a company and 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 why, why people are there. But how do you get these people that say, okay, I, well, here's a path forward. Here's a path forward. We need to, you know, we can do this better. We can do this differently. Or this is what customers really want. And this is the experience that we need to give them. This experience we want to give them, but we're not giving it to them. So it translated into a series of initiatives by people at different levels in the organization that went through a process and learned um, a new set of skills and capabilities that combined with who they were as catalytic leaders, catalytic individuals, made them more powerful, made their teams more powerful, and put the company on a stronger path. Um, and you know, that, that to me is, um, it's transformative, right? Now, obviously any culture changes, you all know way better than I, takes time, but you can't do it in a three-day seminar. <laughs> no, you cannot, no. Thank you for sharing and sort of a final thought for me on that, because you you couldn't have known at the beginning because you don't know what it is until you do it. But I go back to the things that you were sharing about, like the kindness. And it's not enough just to see it, that you have to work through people and your awareness and helping other people with their awareness, all moving the organizational speed. Like those are the skills, essentially, that we're you know, helping the catalyst cultivate. And so it just it's you know the serendipity the spark whatever that is where it's like this is these have been guiding principles for you but like i said you couldn't have possibly known the richness of the alignment there so thank you for um for reaching out and letting us go on that journey with you yeah well thank you for writing the book you know and and <laughs> um you know because that that was the way that i first connected with you and um you know you you have to get that out there right you have to say okay um do you see yourself in this? Do you see your teams in this? Do you see your organization in this? And have you experienced it? There, there is a path forward. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be that way. So just the way, you know, you've got a little bit, so it's interesting. You all have unbelievable corporate backgrounds, right? I'm going to say executive backgrounds, but you got an outlook to you as well, right? You know, which I think is kind of part of the catalyst, you know, uh, psyche is, you know, status quo. Well, status quo isn't like my friend that we go hang out with all the time. So <laughs> um, I think that that combination 
was really important. And you could apply that, you know, at a startup, you could apply it, you know, as an individual. But I think in companies to do things at scale and to accomplish great things, you know, you you need you need many different layers of the organization behind it. So that that book really connected me and then you know started listening to your podcast and started talking to you and then just and watching the magic happen yeah yeah and i'm sure you know it's not easy it's like it's got to it's got to continue um but your ability to go in and and really uh kind of build not, well you do it you honor the past complete the past know that you have to manage today and and create tomorrow right so Thank you for the kind words. Yeah. Before we hit record, when we were chatting before um, the podcast started, you were sharing with us how you've taken these years of experience, the wisdom, the frameworks, and you're really focused in on humanistic leadership was what I heard you call it. And mm-hmm. I would love to just you know take a moment to give you the space to talk to us about how this catalytic learning has crystallized into these next steps for you. Yeah, it's um so interestingly, right? I love data, I love learning, I love reading. And um and I love my daughters, I love my wife. Um, and I've had a lot of uh women in in my life in business and in life that have been huge influences on me. And then I just kind of watched this, these like a, a little bit of a culture clash. Um, and look, I'm painting broad strokes here. People have masculine, feminine qualities, um, all all types of different qualities. But I was reading something that said 8% of the Fortune 1000 CEOs are women. Clearly women aren't 8% of the population. (laughs) Less than 10% of the 195 countries in the world are led by women. And we live in a country that's never been led by a woman. And, um, you know, I have a 27 and a 31 year old daughter who educate me, but increasingly the last 15 years of my career, like most of what I've done is see the possibilities in people. And in healthcare, thankfully, um, there's a lot of women in different roles of healthcare, different levels of leadership. So I just started kind of like peeling this apart and looking at my own uh, journey and say, you know, where I've faltered is when I kind of got sucked into this, you know, really um, kind of aggressive performance driven culture, but it doesn't really need to be that way. And that's how I landed on my coach. I've been working with her for four years. She wrote the book called The Humanized Leader and who she also knows Susan Linder. Um, And, uh, you know, I just said, okay, this is really instructive. This all happened for me, not to me. And so as I, I had a goal to leave corporate when I was 60 years old, I turned 60 years old on June 18th, uh, this year. And, um, I left corporate on June 7th. So I beat it by 11 days. Yay. Um, but I said, all right, well, what, what is my true purpose in life? Well, I love healthcare. Um, the best experiences I've had and the best teams I've been a part of and people that I stay connect with over the years are some of the teams I led that really had those humanistic qualities, you know, to them. And so I said, I, I, I really want to pursue this. So how did I pursue it? Well, you know, start reading. But what I did is that I'm going to interview 50 women leaders in healthcare. Set of four or five open-ended questions. Um, and I'm in the middle of it and really find out like, what are the obstacles? What are the opportunities? What's the path forward? What do the solutions need to look like? And, you know, so far I found three things. One, there's many faces of, of bias, right? Nothing new, but unbelievable stories on the maternal wall bias, um, just the perception of emotion, you know, um, recognition gap, how, you know, people seek recognition. Second, work-life integration, especially relative to caregiving and leadership life, but caregiving in the broader sense, not yeah. caregiving just, you know, children, but caregiving whoever um, is is being looked at for care. And this hit me kind of right in the face because I have a four-year-old grandchild who, uh, grandson, who we spend a lot more time with. He's in kind of a, I have three grandchildren. He's kind of in a tricky situation. 
And, you know, just balancing now as I'm starting my own business, my caregiving responsibility, because he's in full on Papa mode, right? And I love, you know, spending time with him. But listening to the stories about the balancing act and, you know, the career plateaus that you may may face and just the pure mental load, like the cognitive burden of managing work and home, you know, life responsibilities. So work-life integration was big. And then this double bind, like these conflicting expectations placed on, on women leaders um, based on just leadership style. You're expected to be both, you know, assertive and and nurturing, you know, which just kind of feeds into gender stereotypes and then likability versus success and um, just the backlash from that. And really, like, I would say just a perfectionism pressure. Like, I, I would tell you, I never, as a male leader moving through many different organizations and watching male leaders, I don't ever feel like they felt a pressure to be perfect. Um, so this got me super, super interested. And then these interviews, I was telling Shannon earlier, my business plan for my the practice that I'm pursuing right now is 100 interesting conversations a year. So I just said, well, I'm going to I'm going to go start talking to these people. And that just created that that just kind of sparked the catalyst in me saying this is a problem we're solving for because you you care about healthcare. Healthcare is about healing, you know, it's about growth, it's about caring. And so it just seemed like it it brought it all to the surface. And I said, yeah, this uh, this one we'll do for the rest of my life. Well, so, thank uh, you for yeah. taking what you've learned in your journey in healthcare and applying that to really supporting others. Uh, it's a really inspirational story. Thank you for sharing that part with us. Sure. As we wrap up the conversation today, which is always a sad moment, but we love this question. We'd love to hear about your favorite catalyst, past, present, who inspires you, what made them stand out. You told us it was an exciting answer. Drum roll. <laughs> I told you it was a different answer. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got to give you two answers, right? So so one, um, you know, I had two great grandmothers. One I lost too early um, and one that lived to 90 years old. And um, as you can imagine, um, I was a handful uh, when I was a kid. Um, I, maybe many catalysts were a handful when, when they were kids. So I had a grandmother who used to save me, right? Because I would drive my parents nuts. Um, and uh, her name was Lena. And she taught me more about uh, the integration of uh, you know business and life than anyone. And she was like a coach in disguise. So what did she teach me? Uh, she taught me to be curious about people. She taught me to slow down and listen and learn their story to help first to deliver value. So she she really fundamentally had the best core values. She was focused on the right thing. She understood the long game. Not everything was, was in the moment. And she was interested in you not trying to be interesting ever. She was never trying to be interesting. She was always interested Right. So, you know, that is a person that I love, I miss. I mean, I'm, I'm still learning from her. And I ask myself a lot, you know, especially I can tell you uh, I'm a golfer. I can tell you after every swing what I did wrong doesn't mean I'll stop it. The next time, but I can tell you in every interaction that I've had in business and with people. What I did wrong, because it felt. I didn't like the way it felt, you know, coming out of it. So I would always ask myself, it, what would I do? What would my grandmother do if she had this person in front of her? How would she deal with what is coming up inside of me, you know, in the moment? So she's she's my number one, far and away. Now, number two, number two catalyst. Uh, I can't name one. So what I did was I create a virtual advisory board. I have nine people on my virtual advisory board, like Brene Brown, Mary Pat and I, who I mentioned a couple of times, uh, Cheryl Sandberg, uh, Indra Nui, um, Shane Parrish, who I, I like from uh, Knowledge Podcast, who wrote the book Clear Thinking, uh, Charlie Munger, who is just, I, you know, I laugh and learn uh, every time I listen to him, Marshall Goldsmith, so a couple others. He was an executive coach. So what I do is I wrote, a prompt. I probably spent, you know, I don't know, maybe 15 hours, you know, kind of iterating with this. So I wrote a prompt for Gen AI. It has to be people 
that they have a lot of content out there and they've written. They don't have to be alive uh, and they may not always be reachable to, you know, they're not reachable to me. Uh, I wish my grandmother would have wrote more, but those are kind of like emblazoned in, in me. Um, and then I just ask, you know, in this situation, what would my advisory board advise me to do? So I take people that I know and uh, through reading and, and through learning and respect and understand their values, but really different people, <laughs> you know, diverse teams of people and say, in this situation, what would my advisory board tell me? So I feel like I always have these catalysts there. They have inspired me. All those people have inspired me in different ways, but I feel like they're right there, you know, and, and I can, I can get advice from them. I'm totally still in that, that idea, oh my Dominic. Gosh. I'm like, yeah, how quick Tracy, can I get into ChatGPT? Yeah, Tracy knows I'm obsessed with ChatGPT and we have a Catalyst Ignite one that can answer questions like that. But I love this virtual advisory board idea. Yeah. It's just brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. The the people Thank I work you. with, the coaching clients that I work with, they 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 like it too. You know, it's um um and it, it, I don't know. And so that's what inspires me to want to write. And you know, I got a newsletter going. I'm working on a book. Um, and, um, because like at some point, um, you know, you, you'd like to have something that you've learned from all these other folks. How can you, how can you share that? And then to bring it back full circle. So I met you all, right. You right. know, and so like you are indelibly, you know, imprinted in this imperfect person's mind, and um, yeah, I, you know, I'm I'm better for it. So the virtual advisory board is a, is a way to yeah, you can't all get access to these people, but maybe you can just in a different love way. it. Yeah. Dominic, it is always a joy and a pleasure to get to have time with you. Thank you for spending this hour with us today. Yeah, it was great. Uh, it's great seeing you both, and I'm sure our paths will cross again. Oh yeah, they're, they're gonna no, make sure. You don't get to choose. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, that's, that's <laughs> I love that we're aligned on that. It's like no yeah. choice. Yeah. <laughs> and thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to learn more about how to create bold, powerful change in the world, be sure to check out our book, Move Fast, Break Shit, Burn Out, or go to our website at catalystconstellations.com. And if you enjoyed this episode, this conversation half as much as we did, please take 10 seconds to rate it wherever you listen to your podcast, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher. If you have other catalysts in your life, hit the share button and send a link their way. Thanks again.